Okay, I see Carajalios is in the background. I'm gonna I'm gonna read this and then we're gonna get on with Jim Carajalios trying to save Canada one day at a time. In essence, Justin, I thought this was Justin Bieber. Justin believes in the ongoing victimization of law-abiding gun owners by effectively expropriating their property without comp. Oh, there, there is compensation, Brian. It's come on, it's a buyback. It's not a confiscation. It's like the the, the euphemisms of tyranny. It's not a buyback. I'm oh, sorry. It's not a confiscation because we're, we're here, here, here. I I didn't I didn't I didn't you know I, I broke your knees, but here's 500 bucks for crutches. I compensated you. Hold on. What was this? Oh my God. Viva is the first Viva. This is the first I hear that the guy in Texas was in a police car and uniform. No 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 no. Nova Scotia, not Texas. No misinformation there. This was the Nova Scotia shooting. The guy was driving an RCMP car with an RCMP uniform and they knew it. And I think the first time they disclosed it was something like 10 o'clock the next day. They also knew, we'll get to it. And um, last last chat before we bring on Jim. Brent Mosey says, lived in Canada for 15 years, told people Canada was different. I'm wrong. I don't know what you meant when you told them it was different. Okay, so this is really the last one before I bring on Jim. The only mental or wellness tests that need to be given are for individuals who want to become politicians, must have no urge to control others. The transition into Jim Carajalios is going to be very organic because of the coloring in the background. We're going to go from yellow to yellow and bringing it out. Jim, sir, how are you doing? We're doing great. There's... Okay. Um... Hold on. Just do mic check one, two, and I'm going to let the, audio t the audience tell me if your audio is too loud. Mic check one two. Well, it might be loud. It might just be my mic. Let me see. Is it all loud? One... No, don't worry. Here, I'll, you know, I'll automatically adjust. Let me see if the chat says. Um, you know, let's go. And if it's too loud, I'll lower you. I'll lower you on my end. Okay, everyone says good. Uh, Jim. Okay, how you doing? We're doing fantastic. There's um two days to go. The new Blue Party's first election campaign. Voting's on Thursday. And I'm really happy that you uh, gave me the opportunity to come on. So thank you for devoting some time to Ontario provincial politics. Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm not telling people who to vote for. I'm just saying nothing. We have had you on the channel before. You're amazing. Your wife is amazing. You're both, you're both politicians. And I dare say two of the good ones. Um, so the vote is on Thursday. For those who don't know, this is provincial Ontario elections. Um, uh, Give us an update. Give us like the lowdown of what's of what the deal is. So the Doug Ford PCs are up for re-election for a second term, and their strategy has been to um, not let anyone know there's an election. They've been trying to put everyone asleep in this last month, but we've already made history. This is our first election campaign, as we've been on your show before. My wife Belinda is the uh, MPP in the riding of Cambridge, and um, a year and a half ago she. Uh, was uh, removed from the PC caucus and 19 of us were removed from the PC party for voting against Doug Ford's lockdown bill. And we've been working uh, diligently for a year and a half with our members on the ground and our riding leaders. And we were the first party to register 124 candidates, which is one candidate for every single riding in this election. And the media and the Ford PCs have done their absolute most to say as little as possible about the new blue party in this election. And to get through this election as quickly as possible so that as few Ontarians as possible know that there is another option other than the establishment parties. But it's our first election campaign and we've already made a dent. A grassroots strategy, candidates knocking on doors, putting up signs, and we're on the map. The New Blue Party of Ontario is on the map. And in every single riding, there'll be a name of a New Blue Party of the New Blue Party on the ballot in our first election campaign. And now when you say 124 candidates ever, that is a, what we call a full slate. I mean, right. I, th I think some of the major political parties don't even run a full slate, you know, despite being established for a long time. Um, well, okay. So tell us what's going on. Well, first of all, people might not have seen our first one or two interviews. Right. Give us a bit of your rundown, uh, a bit of uh, a bit of your wife and, and tell us who you are, what you've gone through to get to where you are before we even get into some of the issues that are facing Ontarioans right now. So that could probably eat up half the hour, half of the one hour, maybe the whole hour. So I'll try to do the short version. If you want details, you can check out newblueontario.com. But uh, let me just try to do the short version. And you're going to jump in and cut me off if it's dragging on too much. We did everything we could for years 
to work from the inside. That's what the establishment and the lobbyists like to say. You got to work it from the inside. You got to be patient. And that's what we did. Uh, Axe the carbon tax was a campaign I started in 2017. Then I pushed back against voter fraud. And we had thousands of supporters that were behind us in Ontario signing up to join the PC party to say the carbon tax position, you got to be against it. Stop, stop closing up to Justin Trudeau. And they started determining who their candidates were going to be for the last election through voter fraud. And we did everything we could. My wife jumped into provincial politics in 2018 and she ran for the PC. She won a local nomination. We thought there was hope with Doug Ford in charge. But what we quickly saw in the first two years is the PCs were determined to just become the Ontario provincial wing of the Justin Trudeau Federal Liberal Party of Canada. I ran for PC president in 2018. They rigged an entire convention of over a thousand people. And uh, most of the establishment um, uh, members in at that convention stayed very quiet. Didn't want to say a thing. That's still in court. In 2017, before that, they tried to crush our family over the acts of carbon tax campaign by suing me. I won that court case in six weeks when a judge looked at it and said, no legal theory, no facts. And finally, the PC said, enough of this working from the inside, enough of this democracy. This is all nonsense. They corrected voter fraud because they don't have elections inside their parties anymore. It just Doug Ford picks all his candidates. So what a concept, right? You can get away. With, you can solve voter fraud by just not having elections. And in 2020, my wife, the MPP for the riding of Cambridge, was the only current or former PC MPP and the only politician in Canada, federally or provincially, to vote against her own government on a piece of lockdown mandate COVID related legislation. They removed her from caucus over one vote. They removed 19 of us on the Cambridge PC Riding Association, thousands of people across Ontario who had been following us and were upset with the direction of the Ford PC said, we need a new option. We have no one to vote for in 2022. And uh, we started working on a new blue party of Ontario. This stuff takes a long time to put together. I had a health challenge in 2021 that we covered a bit, which slowed us down. Um, uh, Six rounds of chemotherapy and three surgeries for my leg. I'm back and better than ever. Uh, There's no more cancer in my body. I go for checkups every three months. And I've been on the campaign trail all month as the leader of the new blue party. And we were able to get our founding constitution up, register ridings in almost every riding. Uh, As I said, register a candidate in every single riding. We had one gentleman who was forced by his employer on the federal government side to uh, remove himself, but his name is still on the ballot. So we have a new blue party appearing on all 124 ballots in this election. And we have the new blueprint, our party platform, and we've been making a dent in our first election campaign. So uh, beyond our expectations, and uh, we've, I've been traveling and spending the second last day, election day minus 48 hours with you, and we'll do another live stream tomorrow with Richard Sirrett, who you know. Uh, absolutely. Richard Sirrett is on uh, the Saga 960 or Saga right. 690. I forget which one it is. I, I love her. I love Richard. Um, th- what you just described, for anybody who has never dabbled in politics, It's almost not what's, I don't know if insurmountable is the right word. It's incomprehensible almost to fathom that you've done all this. And this is not to kiss your butt at all. No, butt, except for the butt, no, no, butt kissing. It's, it's inconceivable that you've done this in such a short period of time. What has been the workload like to get this done? Is this 24 seven and and who, and how do you raise money? How do you live while you're doing this? It's all fueled on the shoulders of our supporters on the ground. And it's only possible because people uh, push us forward and our loyal supporters say, keep moving forward. And I'll be honest, when, when, when we were struck with my health challenge, it was after we announced the new blue party because we announced it in October of 2020. And two months later I got diagnosed. And uh, there were many times when you're like, I, I couldn't walk for uh, almost a year because my right leg was broken. And um, I had a full uh, leg cast from uh, the top to the bottom of my uh, leg. And I had to relearn how to walk. And there was many times when, uh, you know, I, I doubted and I said, what, what am I doing this for? Like, what, wh- wh- where, where is the end? I know why I was doing it, but you know, when you're not feeling well, uh, idle hands are the work of the devil and the devil creeps in your mindset. But you look at uh, all of the riding leaders that we have and all of the members and the supporters on the ground and the prayers that they would send and um, um, the calls and the emails and the messages. And they said, we will support you because you're doing the right thing. 
And we want you to keep moving forward. And we want you to take care of yourself and your family and our little guy first. Um, um, but keep pushing forward if that's what you believe uh, you need to do. And it is necessary for the future of Ontario because the best is yet to come. We just have to make sure we don't stop. And it was on all of my campaign stops. Last week, I did four stops starting in Aurelia, ending in Sudbury, came back. Two days ago, I went out to Alexandria and back on the same day. And uh, every meet, every meeting we have with supporters on the ground, they look me in the eye and they give you all the motivation and all the fuel you need to keep going. We made uh, uh, an expansive process of uh, applying to run as a new Blue Party candidate. And we had uh, over 124 people eager to run. We had three nominations where more than one qualified candidate stepped forward in ridings and um, more applicants than uh, we would have imagined. And it's all very humbling. And whenever you get a roadblock or a trial or a tribulation uh, and, you and, and, and doubt creeps in my mind and you think maybe uh, it's time to pack it up, you look a supporter in the eye and they say to you, you have given me hope again. I haven't voted for years uh, and you have given me hope to vote. Uh, and it's all the encouragement you need and um, or, or that I need. And the other encouragement is every day playing with our son, Victor, and knowing that um, if we don't do what we're doing, things will get worse a whole lot faster. And uh, my wife and I and our team and with hundreds of people on the ground, we put it together for June 2nd in our first election campaign. Um, so I, I, you know, when you say you look in the eyes of supporters and it, it, it makes you want to you know, keep going and go harder. I don't, I don't know if it's being blackpilled, but you know, I, I, when I'm talking to people and they like do something and I say, I don't, I don't know what's left to be done here. Um, I, but I do think if, if we are to see a party like your party with your principles and your policies actually succeed, people might be more convinced by my underlying theory that this has to be a political revolution, a political victory and not anything else. Um, what, what the, the biggest policy questions before I we'll, we'll get into Justin Trudeau's announced gun ban because it does have local municipal level uh, consequences. Yes. What are the biggest policies right now uh, of the of the blue party that you wish to implement if you are to or at least wish to be meaningful opposition on if you get elected? You made you made a couple statements there and there's a couple different points to pack in and respond to in addition to your question about what we're running on. And the new blueprint is our platform. Did you know the Ford PCs don't even have a platform? They're running for re-election and they haven't released an election platform. I'm this is Google this. stuff. And they are they are running on a budget they tabled on the last day of the legislature. And they threw the budget down and ran out of the building before Belinda could ask them any questions, before debate could be had. Um, and they just got out of there. And, and Doug Ford's been hiding. The establishment media has been helping him because they set up these rules for the debate, the leaders debate. And they said, you need to have a sitting MPP and a candidate in every riding. And we achieved that. And then they just changed the rules. And they said, well, no, no, forget it. We don't want new blue in there. So he's campaigning on no platform. We've got the new blueprint, which is the most pressing issues that have come up in the last four years of the Ford PCs betraying um, uh, their values and principles. And it starts with we were obviously the first to start speaking out against the lockdown and mandate measures uh, related to COVID in Ontario. The Doug Ford PCs have been running away from it. And we knew they were going to do that, but we are calling for a ban on COVID vaccine passports using legislation and fines to do that, whether it's in the private or the public sector. And in addition to that, restitution for those that were harmed by the state of emergencies that Doug Ford put in place, like the trucking businesses, they shut down 39 of them without due process after the uh, Ottawa protest. And uh, in addition, a rollback of all of, uh, all of the PC's legislation in the last two years, related to COVID, including Bill 100. Uh, but we knew that this was going to have to be a party built more than just on lockdowns and mandates because the Ford PCs were going to run away from their record. And the other items that we're talking about, getting rid of the taxpayer subsidy for political parties in Ontario. Many people aren't aware that in the last 10 years, the Liberals, the NDP, and the PC party in Ontario have been operating and funding their operations through taxpayer money on a per vote subsidy basis 
over $100 million in 10 years. The Ford PC said they were going to get rid of it. They brought back the subsidy and increased it by 40%. And uh, renewing political accountability starts with getting taxpayer money out of the pockets of political parties. We're the only party campaigning on that. They gave the lifeline to the Toronto Star, which was going bankrupt a couple of years ago. They gave them an online gambling license. We need one provincial party in Ontario that stands up for free press and defunding the established media. That means canceling the Toronto Star's online gambling license. And I'll give you the, the next three uh, top headline items that, that I guess um, I would say um, uh, gets a lot of support for us. In healthcare, rehiring the nurses that lost their jobs and other healthcare workers uh, as, a, as a response to or in relation to the mandates that we saw come in place with the Ford PCs. Belinda was the only MPP to stand up against critical race theory in our schools with that Bill 67 that we covered. So we're talking about uh, banning critical race theory and left-wing political ideologies from the classroom and offering tax credits for those who choose to homeschool or have alternative education and because they can't wait for the new blue party to reform the education system. And finally, on the economy, tax relief by reducing the HST, getting rid of Doug Ford's industrial carbon tax. Yes. Doug Ford put in an industrial carbon tax, similar to what happened to you guys in Quebec, and taking down the wind turbines so we can reduce electricity rates and get Ontario's economy back up and running. Those are the seven key points of our new blueprint and our party platform. And the Ford PCs have no platform other than to extend the legacy of the McGinty win liberals. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up the, uh, we talked about the Bill 67, but let me bring it up just to refresh everybody's memory. Uh, Jim, you see this? Yes. Okay. So Bill 67, Racial Equity in the Education System Act 2022. Uh, a number of amendments. I just want to get to the, 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 uh, da, da, da. I want to get to some of the, 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 the most important ones. Promoting racial equity in schools, racial equity related requirements to function on the council. Uh, summarize this law for people who don't know. I mean, the headline is pretty, is pretty self-explanatory, but they want to implement not equality, but equity. Uh, and those are two very distinct terms. What, what was the essence of this bill, which also made, I think it made national headlines. This is a great example of one of many times in the last four years, the Ford PCs have jumped on board with left-wing uh, ideology or top-down establishment ideology against the rights of taxpayers and parents. And they do it in the hope that the media won't actually expose what the details are. So an MPP in the legislature in Ontario put forward Bill 67 a couple months ago and a nice, you know, uh, like you said, uh, uh, a headline or a title of the legislation that it'd be hard to disagree with. Everyone is uh, against uh, racism. And um, it went through the legislature and uh, not much was said. I think a couple articles on True North News uh, were talked about, it, uh, spoke about the details of the bill. And the, the foundation of this bill is based on critical race theory, even though they don't actually say critical race theory in the bill, because the foundation of the bill, and if you hear the MPP who tabled it and her, or her presentations and her uh, speeches inside and outside the legislature, it's based on the idea that our schools in Ontario are all systemically racist. And it gets even worse when you read into what they planned on doing to combat, quote unquote, systemic racism in our schools, which is to fine students or others, teachers, parents in the education system for subconscious racism. And we'll define they, they were planning on defining what that is later on. And the Ford PCs in the legislature, every single MPP in the legislature, even independents like Rick Nichols, voted in favor of this bill. Belinda was the only one to vote against it at second reading because we need three readings for something to become law. There were three MPPs in the legislature from the PC side that were in debate enthusiastically saying, I can't wait for this to become law, which even on a fiscal standpoint, it boggles the mind because the bill was calling for forcing school boards to hire um, um, uh, administrators and bureaucrats trained in this political ideology. After Belinda voted against it at second reading, um, you were so gracious to have us on and cover how important it was. Many others started talking about it, even though some of the others uh, didn't mention that Belinda was the one that voted against the bill. Conrad Black wrote about it in a very good piece 
about us just uh, a few days ago in the National Post, and he mentioned Belinda voted against it. And by raising awareness two weeks later, Belinda went back to the legislature, questioned the, uh, the PCs about the bill, and got them to publicly reverse course. From in It's amazing how opinions and the science can change in two weeks. Uh, two weeks earlier, they were saying they were all for it. Two weeks later, they said they wouldn't uh, uh, pass it through third reading and make it law. And on the last day of the legislature, she was able to table and read out and put on the record of the Ontario legislature a petition that we had at stopwoke.ca uh, against critical race theory in our schools. And that all came together very quickly in two to four weeks. And it highlights the necessity of having the new Blue Party of Ontario, both inside and outside of the legislature across Ontario, because the establishment parties and the establishment press, when ideas like this are brought forward, they give it as little attention as possible, and they don't allow the public to know the details of the bill unless someone decides to go on the legislative website and read it on their own. And it's important that we talk about this stuff, raise awareness, and get the grassroots effort to push back, and it can provide results if that is done. And so the bill is is dead in the water. It's, it's not it's not coming back anytime soon that anybody knows of. Well, I went to committee after second reading and then the election was called. They didn't bring it back for third reading. And Belinda uh, uh, pushed the PCs to say they're not bringing it back. But whatever happens after election day on June 2nd, an MPP can bring it back. And we've yep. got to remain diligent on this stuff and uh, flag it if uh, another MPP brings it back. And I'm pretty confident that the NDP will bring it back in some form. And uh, the PCs, if no one's looking and no one's talking about it, they'll just enthusiastically pass it. The best part of this that I also forgot to mention was the local media in Waterloo Region uh, demanded that Belinda explain why she voted against the bill. And uh, there was an article written up where she explained it better than I uh, just did. And the NDP MPP who was advocating for the bill in that article could only conclude her advocacy for this solution by saying, well, at least we're talking about racism. And when they say that, you know, they've thrown the white flag and they can't even defend their own ideas, like the education system being systemically racist, the idea that we should fine parents, teachers, students for subconscious racism. And that was only possible by uh, you and others raising awareness to it and Belinda taking the lead and our grassroots supporters um, uh, contacting MPPs and saying this is outrageous. Yeah, you know, it's it's they, they use the same uh, justification with Justice Smollett. Like after the hoax became known, they say, well, these things do happen and it's important we talk about it. Right. Um, that that law or that proposed bill, which basically, it, like we discussed at the time, presupposes the, uh, racism within the educational institution. If it's there, I don't think a law, <laughs> if it's in the system itself, a law is going to do nothing. Uh, if it's in the system itself, revent, you know, have a look at the system. It, it's possible that it's not actually in the system, but it's actually only in the eyes of these politicians who want to create the problem so they can then solve it. You know, talking about institutionalized racism in the education system while at the same time implementing these vaccine passport bans, which disparately impact certain races and certain minorities. So yeah, it's ironic that there might actually be some form of institutionalized racism. It just might happen to be with the policymakers and not the institutions or the people. But on on that on that subject of sorts, I guess we've got to know your position on uh, the Ottawa protest because I mean, that, although that was that made national headlines, it was something of an Ontario issue. You're going to be asked to opine on it. I don't know what you said publicly or what your position is publicly. How do you feel about the protest itself, the government response from Ottawa to the federal, and uh, you know what what would you have done differently? Well, I was there the first weekend, uh, the Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the Ottawa protest, the trucker convoy. And uh, we, the new blue team, uh, got there and it was very peaceful and it was very cold, but it was very peaceful. And there were lots of people. And we were proud that we were able to get speakers and a mic on a flatbed. So the new blue team locally and our candidates led the way. We rented a speaker and speakers and, and a mic uh, on that uh, Friday and Saturday. We put it on a flatbed. And it allowed for the crowd to hear from speakers, including Ezra Levant. And because it all just came together so quickly and we were happy to do whatever we could to just help out. And um, the the convoy was not about me. It wasn't about others. Some of the others uh, that uh, that um, uh, decided to label themselves as leaders of the convoy protest 
tried to turn the convoy protest into something that was uh, um, uh, driven by them. I'm uh, thinking of uh, one or two of them that decided to run in this provincial election against the new blue after the fact. But the the crowd was peaceful. And when we came back very quickly thereafter, Doug Ford didn't get the message. He doubled down and he decided to test the market or test the waters first on a state of emergency before Trudeau even did it. So Doug Ford called a state of emergency provincially and was using a lot of the rhetoric that Justin used federally before Trudeau did it. And he used he he put the state of emergency in. He used uh, the powers under that to shut down 39 trucking businesses without due process. And he really gave Justin Trudeau political cover um, uh, in Ontario for what followed two or three days later. But I would say this, what uh, as quickly as Justin Trudeau brought in his state of emergency, uh, Trudeau and Ford ran away from it just as quickly because of the grassroots feedback. And um, it was great to see some conservative politicians federally finally, finally get around to uh, saying something and whether they're um, genuine about it or not, um, we'll let the voters decide and we'll let uh, those politicians decide, but better late than never. And uh, it was good to see the pushback. And then when they introduced Bill 100 in the legislature in Ontario to make those some of those measures in the state of emergency permanent, Belinda was the first MPP in the legislature to debate against Bill 100 at second reading. Her and three others voted against it at second reading, which again is an example of um, bringing awareness to this bill because it wasn't getting a lot of coverage. There wasn't much debate about it. The establishment parties were all for it. It's a terrible bill. It strips away due process um, and and can you, the government can just decide to um, file charges, shut down your business provincially. Uh, it passed into law because they passed it at third reading in the middle of the evening, which our, which is a time when the legislature should not be sitting. But we raised awareness to it, and more and more Ontarians know about Bill 100 now, and we will keep advocating against it as part of our commitment to roll back and do a, a, a complete review of all the laws that Doug Ford and the PCs have put in place in the last two years in response to COVID-related lockdowns and mandates. I want to pull up, uh, let me just add to stream, and I'm going to change this one. I want to bring up that particular an article on that bill um, oh, Tabarnouche, what is this? Bill 67. This is what I'm going to replace with here. Okay, delete. So Bill 100, what were the, uh, I mean, offhand, specific issues. I remember what, some of the issues, which was blocking, uh, you can have your license suspended, your car, your car impounded for blocking, um, what do they call it in the law? For blocking uh, trade routes? Allowing they, used a, they used a more generic term than that, infrastructure, um, uh, and and the the infrastructure could be uh, changed at a later date by regulation. So it wasn't like they were locking down what the protected infrastructure would be, and uh, you, and you know they uh, there's so much wrong with the bill. For starters, a protest outside of Parliament Hill doesn't in my eyes, uh, account as protected transportation infrastructure. Second, the protests that was going on at the border uh, in southwestern Ontario, they weren't blocking the entire bridge and they were co the protesters were cooperating with law enforcement. Third, law enforcement already had have the powers uh, federally and provincially if there actually was infrastructure being uh, blocked. Um, and and uh, fourth, it strips away all due process in uh, this process where uh, you're no longer presumed innocent until proven guilty. They use the powers under the state emergency to shut down 39 trucking businesses. And what the, the biggest issue, there's two big issues with this law that uh, I think uh, don't get a lot of um, uh, discussion because it might be a little esoteric. Number one, at the bottom of the bill or near the bottom of the bill, there's a line that says, we will review the enforcement of this bill by uh, police powers or agencies every year. Uh, you would know this. That's like the government admitting publicly that they're not really sure that they're on a good ground here constitutionally, that this bill would be used properly by anyone who enforces it, whether it's law enforcement or anyone else. So uh, that's like they just throw up the white flag and they go, I don't, we don't even know if this is actually legal or constitutional. That's the first red flag. The second thing 
is that we have seen provincial and federal governments apply this type of uh, legislation based on your political beliefs. So in 2020, when protesters were uh, blocking um, uh, trains from going forward, uh, that was okay. And there's other infrastructure pro uh, projects in Ontario that have ground to a halt regardless of court orders for years and years, and the government does nothing. They just let leave the protesters. But if you are an opponent of Justin Trudeau's and his good buddy Doug Ford, they use powers like this to throw everything at you. And we just yesterday, one of the stories was uh, the banks, um, uh, one of the banks, Scotia Bank, apologized to uh, B.J. Dichter for uh, freezing his account. And this is kind of the random powers that government wants without the checks and balances, without the due process to say, we're just going to do whatever we want. And we'll apply the law differently based on your political beliefs. And we'll ask questions later. Oh, we'll do a review next year. We'll see how Bill 100 worked out. By that point in time, the damage has been done to trucking businesses or others that were involved in the protest. And it's such expansive powers. Can you imagine if uh, you have someone living in your house, whether a family member or not, who goes and participates in a in a protest in Ottawa for a day and comes back and your bank accounts are frozen because you're the property owner of someone who went there and they say, well, here's Bill 100. We could just do it. No due process, no checks and balances. I'm reading a, a Rumble rant on over at Rumble and someone says, after Sussman and the new gun law announcement, it's nice to see someone, anyone, not throwing in the towel. And Jim, I think they're referencing you. Thank Mike you. Can't throw in the towel. There's many of us, many, many of us. I'm just lucky to be able to um, speak on behalf of new blue party members and candidates. I'm just, I have to block a sex bot, uh, Jim. We have, we have, we have in, been infiltrated by bots in this, in this chat. Um, okay. So that's bill, bill, that's bill 100. We've done bill 67. We've talked about the protest, uh, the latest Trudeau announcing the nationwide gun ban and, or, or what is it called? Freezing of, of handguns. My understanding, it's very not superficial. It's just new. Uh, is that what he's going to do is authorize municipalities to outright ban small firearms on their own and not go through the federal level on that? Is that are, are you familiar with what uh, the plan is with this newly uh, announced law? I'm still catching up on uh, the announcement because it's federal law and we're a provincial party. So we like to focus what we're saying on provincial laws and what the provincial parties are doing. But Doug Ford's contribution to um, Trudeau going after taxpayers, going after parents, going after... Um, the right to protest going after businesses and now going after uh, gun owners is uh, traditionally in politics. The Ontario, quote unquote, conservative leader, which the Doug Ford PCs are no longer conservative, but many still think that they're the conservative option. You could count on them to stand up to the federal Trudeau liberals or other liberal leaders in the past if they veer too far into the left or too authoritarian. And when Trudeau's got a guy like Doug Ford and the PCs, He's created a wing of the Liberal Party of Canada in Ontario, and he knows he's not going to get any political pushback from Doug Ford on anything, including this. He just gets to do whatever he wants. And uh, in this scenario, he's going after um, uh, gun owners, and they're going to keep pushing this uh, going forward. Um, the other part of it, though, that uh, I believe is a lot of what he's announced is not new, and he's just repackaging it uh, for political rhetoric, and he's trying to see how far he can get. So. I will catch up with that um, uh, federal legislation. It's something to keep our eye on uh, because we've always um, um, respected and defended the rights of legal gun owners um, and the attacks from the left to blame them for all of the uh, ills of society. Yeah, the the, um, the buyback and the five rounds uh, per per um, oh per magazine that I think is older. That that I think he is rehashing old stuff. I think the new stuff is the outright freeze on. Um, on small arms and he's creating, he's going to just create a black market for this. Right. Stuff. He's, he's, he's going to make it bigger. The, the right. whole issue. I'll, I'll get to it when you're not, when we're done with the interview, I'm going to get to some of the articles. The black market is the problem. Not the, yes. not the lawfully procured yeah. firearms. Yes. Um, okay. And you say, uh, that, um, Trudeau within the province has his own liberal party. I tell people that Ford is progressive conservative and they say, what the hell is that? And I never even stopped to think about it for one second. What the hell is progressive conservative? Like, yeah. if you think about it too hard, uh, it won't it, 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 forget it. Like, and that's most of what the Ford PCs are doing. Like, he got elected on axing the carbon tax. He lifted it right out of my campaign. 
He got rid of cap and trade in Ontario. And then a few months later, he said, I'm going to bring that back, but I'm going to call it something else in regulation. He got rid of the green vehicle, uh, the electric vehicle subsidies that Kathleen Wynne and Dalton McGinty were doing. And then he brought it back bigger and better, hundreds of millions of dollars funding to industry to say, I'm going to create this industry and it's going to be entirely dependent on uh, government funding. So it's it doesn't make any sense. It's uh, it's something that's been passed down through generations and generations in our political system. And um, I believe uh, it was probably like 100 years ago, there was a blue party from lower Canada and they merged with another party to create the conservative party. And somewhere along the way, someone said, let's take this conservative thing over and insert the name progressive. And uh, it allows the PCs to say, look, conservatives in our name, but really we're progressive. And it's gotten so bad under the Ford PCs, under Doug Ford, and even before him with the prior leader, the PC party of Ontario has made a decision strategic in their mind to become the wing provincially of the Justin Trudeau Liberal Party of Canada. They don't even pretend anymore. The most they pretend is they see the new blue party. They hope that we wouldn't get 124 candidates. They threw everything they could at us in uh, subversive measures by saying others were going to start parties. We still got 124 candidates. So now they come out and they campaign without a platform and they do a couple of things. They say, you got to vote for us because the other guys are worse. Mm hmm. Right. Worse. OK. They run ads and they use our rhetoric. They're using our rhetoric on ads, attacking the NDP and saying the NDP might bring back lockdowns like they did. And it's like they're uh, projecting onto the NDP what they plan on doing after the election. And then they they, they send out some uh, teasers in their budget, like a tax cut for six months on gas. And then you've got to read the fine print that says only for six months, only for six months. So um, we have to keep pushing forward because they've made a decision to clamp down all democracy. You can't work from the inside. You can't run for a nomination, the PC party. You can't go to a convention of the PC party and uh, fight for policy, elect for elect someone to run the party as president, uh, which is the guts of the party or uh, the executive. And now the way to influence it is from the outside, and that's the new Blue Party of Ontario, to keep them accountable and to do the following things. Challenge the left, whether PC, Liberal, NDP, Green. Balance the narrative so we have a discourse here that's uh, balanced in Ontario politics and change the course. And it takes time, though. I know people are desperate for help and desperate for change. But like you said, we're trying to still figure out how long ago progressive and conservative got in the same name of a political party but they've been around for over 100 years. My grandmother didn't speak any English, but she knew what PC was and she knew what liberal was and she knew and what NDP was. And we just started the New Blue Party a year and a half ago. We really got going at full steam in the fall and we've been able to accomplish more than uh, we expected and surpass our expectations. But when you're fighting against a brand that's over 100 years old, it takes time and there's no shortcut. There's no getting on the elevator, hitting you know, floor 25 and zipping up there in a couple of minutes, you got to take it step by step. But every step we take, we gain momentum. That's the difference. Uh, have you done any polling to see how you're how you're faring or, or which ridings you have a better chance of uh, getting someone elected in? Uh, the pollsters in Ontario are all partisans and they all uh, uh, I'm not giving our donor money and our donor money to partisan hacks to tell me uh, what I already know. And they would do a poll and they'd say, well, your party's new and not everybody knows about it. Well, thank you. I know that already. I don't need to give you thousands of dollars of our donor money, Mr. Polster, for you to tell me that. Uh, what we have seen is some uh, trends where uh, increasingly we're the party that um, more and more Ontarians, more than the other parties are looking into, uh, whether it's online in other areas. We had a, a commitment and a, and a conference to train our candidates to do a grassroots effort. And I reminded uh, some of um, our local campaign um, uh, team uh, recently some studies that were um, done in the U.S. on politics for decades. They've looked at what influences someone to change their vote and what impacts getting out the vote on Election Day. And they looked at TV ads. They looked at mailings. They looked at media coverage. And uh, we've got a lot of disadvantages. We've got the fact that the establishment media won't put us on a debate, on a leader's debate, so that people can see uh, who I am and who Belinda are or, and more than 
the thousands of people who already know us. We've got over 10 million people in Ontario. And one of the things that has the best impact on changing people's minds and their habits, because voting PC or voting liberal are a habit for many, many people for decades, is one-on-one -on -one conversations. And that means talking to 10 million people one-on-one. -on -one. That takes time. And uh, the Ford PCs are trying to get through this 30 days as quickly as possible. But we had our candidates commit to a grassroots strategy. Signs were being put up on day one of the campaign across Ontario, caught people's attention, and uh, canvassing teams across Ontario. And our support um, was able to gain traction a lot quicker than any other party in their first election campaign. And I know whatever the result is on June 2nd, it's going to be historic because I'm fairly confident that we will do better in our first election campaign than any other new party in uh, in a very, very long time in Ontario or across Canada. Now, you know, polling, I think, is fundamentally flawed. Corrupt probably is the best word. Um, but you can tell a lot from donations and donors. We, I don't know if I'm allowed asking the number, but how have your physical donations, like monetary donations, fared? And what indication has that given you of grassroots support for the party? Well, we've been very fortunate since we announced to uh, be supported by um, uh, grassroots donors. The establishment parties, like the PCs, get $5.9 million a year in taxpayer money. It just goes to them. And we don't have that because they designed the law when they brought it back to say, if you're a new party, you don't get any. So they've already, I guess they need the help. That's how much of a threat we are. They need to give themselves taxpayer money. Uh, I've been so busy leading the party um, our CFOs on top of the, the dollar values, but we were able to afford um, um, a lawn signs, a generic new blue party of Ontario lawn signs that uh, our party from a central uh, standpoint had them ready to go on day one of the campaign. So uh, right away when we got started, all of a sudden um, people were seeing new blue party of Ontario lawn signs across Ontario. And then our candidates were fundraising and getting their own lawn signs up and running throughout the 30 days. We were running radio ads in a lot of radio stations in all parts of Ontario, and that all helped to raise awareness. But it, I, I can't stress enough, uh, we always need more support on the ground. But the one thing that we need, and we're very grateful to those who uh, spend their hard-earned money and give their donations to the New Blue Party, and they get a tax credit at the end of the year. But the one thing is awareness. And um, when you start a new party and you're a year and a half out to get going and you're really full steam ahead in the fall, many, many people um, will not know about us, will not know there's an option. Uh, one of the biggest components of our supporters, or the largest number, are people who say they have stopped voting for years and they lost hope in the system. All the parties sound the same. No one was speaking towards uh, their values and principles or they were pretending like the PCs. And we have a lot of supporters who've come out to volunteer. They're putting up signs uh, across Ontario and they say, I, I've never had a membership in a party. I haven't voted in years. And they're, they're leading. They're leading as riding leaders. Some of them are running as candidates and putting in signs. And so our goal is to get 10 million people plus to know about the New Blue Party of Ontario through one-on-one -on -one conversations. And then they can make the decision, party's for me or the party is not. And look... We can't be, I've, I've wanted to have this conversation with you for a very long time, actually. We can't, it's, it's not true to say that we've done everything we can. It's not true. Like, changing your vote from what your dad or your grandparents voted in Ontario Provincial Policy is not like trying a new soda at the supermarket, where someone comes up with a new cola and you go in and you see it on the shelf and you say, I'm going to try this new cola. And if the cola tastes like terrible, you go, I'll go back to the other cola. A vote is someone trusting their vote into your party to say, I feel confident that you can run the government of Ontario and all the money that it has and all the levels of, levers of power that it has. And uh, we have full confidence that we can do that. But Ontarians don't know who I am uh, as well as you do, or as well as my wife does, or as well as our um, candidates and our party members do because they're busy in between elections, taking their kids to school, raising their families, going to work, holding on to their jobs, looking for new jobs when the government forces them to lose their job. And they're not following the intricacies of party politics and who's this guy, Jim, and who's Belinda. So we can't get ahead of ourselves and say, 
oh yeah, we're going to start a party and in a year and a half, we're going to win a majority. That's not how it works. They blindly, a lot of people habitually vote PC or liberal because even though they can't stand Doug Ford, even though they think he's a total flop, even though they may even think he's corrupt, they have this comfort or this idea that there are people they don't know behind the PCs that have competence and know what they're doing. If they only knew what I knew, that the people behind Doug Ford uh, are not very competent and don't really know what they're doing, uh, and, mo and all Ontarians had that awareness, we would be growing much faster, but it takes one-on-one -on -one votes and we can't get ahead of ourselves and say that in 18 months we've done everything uh, we can already do. It's not like buying soda. Uh, voting for a new political party requires time and we have to earn their trust. And we are not going to be the party that blames Ontarians for the result on June 2nd and says that they are ignorant or they don't know what's going on, especially when I see on Facebook, I see people who've been calling themselves freedom fighters for the last two years, or I see others who've been criticizing the Ford PCs for two years and they've said, oh, I'm going to vote for the Ford PCs. And they are the exact same people who attack Ontarians for their views, and now they're going back to the person that betrayed them for the last four years and voting for him again one more time. Uh, okay, so highlight their guy TV. Hi there, guys TV says, Viva, he said tear down the windmills. Can you get him to clarify that? Sounds like a waste and a political show. It's a great uh, question. It's not. It's all driven on reducing electricity rates. The show is putting those things up in the first place. So... The McGinty Win Liberals created a ban banana republic out of our electricity grid in Ontario. They came up with this idea to put wind turbines up. 50 cents to 80 cents a kilowatt hour is what they were giving the developers of these wind turbines. It used to be make up 5% of the electricity grid in Ontario. It's now grown to 10 or 13%. The Ford PCs came in and for years the PC party said they were against wind turbines and they were going to uh, do everything they could to take them down. Not only did they not take them down, they have the tallest wind turbines in Ontario's history that have gone up in Stormont, and I just made a stop there two days ago with our team. They went up in Stormont, 29 of these things, the tallest in Ontario's history. They look like the aliens landed. It's, it's so terrible how they've destroyed the, the landscape across rural Ontario. But the real tragedy with these things is the fact that electricity rates in Ontario have tripled in 20 years, if not more. And the primary um, source for driving up the cost is the wind turbines. And we don't even use most of the wind electricity because it's produced in off-peak times. So we have to dump it because you can't store it. We dump it into neighboring jurisdictions for pennies on the dollar while we're paying the developers 50 to 80 cents to produce it. And sometimes the Ontario government pays neighboring jurisdictions to take the electricity and we're overproducing electricity because the rest of the grid to make room for the wind turbines is underproducing from where it could. And so you could remove or decommission the wind turbines, bring down electricity rates, and you wouldn't even need to replace it in the short term. Um, and you would save hundreds of millions of dollars over the next 10 to 20 years um, uh, on electricity rates for every single Ontarian by just getting rid of these things and restore the beautiful landscape we have in rural Ontario. When Doug Ford took over as premier, there were a million manufacturing jobs in Ontario. We're down to 750,000. And for 20 years, the economy in Ontario has been puttering along at one, one and a quarter percent of GDP growth. Terrible numbers. Our social services expenditures are rising at 6% plus. So we've got to get, we, conservatives used to say we've got, we don't have a revenue problem, we have a spending problem. With the liberals and the PCs, we have both. And if we don't get our economy growing again, um, uh, I fear uh, drastic cuts that are going to come in the future. The only way to get the economy growing again is to get electricity rates down. And the only way to do that is get rid of the wind turbines as soon as possible. One more thing, David. They used to say in the PC party, you can't do that. If you take down the wind turbines, what happens to the message you're sending to the investment community? It's such a bad message. But when COVID hit, all of a sudden, the legislature had the power to shut down mom and pop businesses, 
fire people, mandate. Oh yeah, no, no problem. There's no, there's no uh, restrictions or limitations on the power for the Ontario legislature. If the Ontario legislature and governments have the power to shut down fish and chips businesses like I grew up in with my dad or hair salons or other small businesses, then they have the power to end the wind turbine ripoff that has made our electricity grid a banana republic. And that's what the New Blue Party's uh, core promise is for um, a boosting and getting our economy back on track in Ontario. Well, but but uh, setting aside the windmill issue, what do you do to boost energy or to reduce the costs? I mean, you have to you have to produce it somewhere. So what, what are you going to be producing, using to produce energy in Ontario? The first, the first thing is to the, the existing grid outside of the wind turbines is not operating at near 100% capacity. It's down to 48% or something like that. So uh, the rest of the grid has to... Um, um, uh, start producing at what its capacity is. And then there are plenty of other uh, options, whether it's bringing in electricity from neighboring jurisdictions or natural gas uh, or uh, and getting the nuclear plants to operate at a much higher uh, uh, effectiveness and capacity than they already have. But at the bottom, no, what was I was going to say at the bottom of this, shouldn't even be on the list are wind turbines. Like they should be gone. The alien invasion should be over and they should be out of here. And uh, it would make the biggest impact to lowering electricity rates in Ontario uh, and and boosting our economy again. Is uh, people are ch are uh, commenting about birds in the chat? I've heard the rumors. Is is it the case that wind turbines actually kill as many birds as people suggest they do? I've read those reports, and I'm not um, uh, I'm not the person best to that I, that have studied it. But I've heard a lot about the environmental impacts, and just look at the monstrosity of the things. The amount of you know, talk about greenhouse gas emissions that the left likes to talk about. The amount of the manufacturing process that has to go in to building one of those things. Uh, it's so hypocritical to say that it's helping the environment. It's not. It's a total ripoff. And then we have other um, uh, factors of how it destroys the landscape, um, wildlife in the area. Um, but the one thing that's underreported or not spoken enough about um, uh, there's a gentleman, Parker Gallant, who writes a lot about it in the Financial Post and has his own website. And, and I rely on a lot of uh, his research for years. But the one thing that's not spoken a lot about, especially with people in urban uh, settings that don't see them and they think, oh, it's OK, wind turbine far, far away from me. I don't have to see it. I mean, can you imagine if we just put all the wind turbines on Young Street, uh, just start right uh, downtown Young Street, go all the way up to North Toronto? Uh, there'd be a lot of pushback, but what's not spoken about is how these wind turbines are the primary cause of skyrocketing electricity rates for the last uh, decade plus in Ontario. No, no they say, how, how do you think they're built? They have to clear land trees, which, right. no, I think, I think what people tend to uh, think is meant by the killing birds is that birds fly into them and get, and then get crushed by the spinning wheels. Um, I, you know, the funny thing is other people also don't necessarily appreciate, you got to manufacture them. You got to you got to truck those turbines out to where they place them is in the in the boondocks. I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere, so you got to truck them out there. You got to right. clear the land. You got to clear the land to it. It's um, people think it's like, it's as green energy as Tesla's, as though the battery and the rare minerals don't have to get mined somewhere on Earth. Um, Bill, I mean, uh, Jim, sorry, I don't know who Bill is. Okay. I, Jim, I, I've got to ask the question. How nervous are you for this coming Thursday? Are you, are you sleeping at night? Can you sleep? I'm sleeping good because um, we've achieved uh, more than uh, we could have expected in our first election campaign, and we know we're going to make history. But every single vote counts, and I want to make sure that people get out to vote on June 2nd. And we've got a get-out-the-vote efforts uh, across Ontario, um, and um, we have uh, people that support us um, uh, may be deflated or may skip the vote because of a lot of what the establishment media has been saying about this election. It's already decided. It's perfunctory. Oh. Uh, we already know the conclusion. And you can we cannot allow that to happen because this is a long-term project for us. We have to keep building. I know that we're going to surpass expectations with 124 uh, ridings where they're going to see new blue. The you know some of these other uh, politicos had these propositions for us to cancel half of our candidates at the last minute. Can you imagine um, if we went into our first election campaign and in half the ridings in Ontario there wasn't New Blue Party on the ballot? How much that would have stalled uh, our growth and our ability to make an impact going forward? 
And so we we had to explain to people why I don't cancel our candidates and why we have a long term vision. But so now millions of people are going to go to the polls on Thursday and they're going to see new blue and many of them for the first time. And many of them are going to vote for the new blue party of Ontario. And it's going to be the first time in Ontario's history that uh, a new party came up and it's not the, the leading three or the greens. And they had the new blue on the ballot in every single riding. And they're going to cast the vote. And many of them are not going to vote for us because they're not going to be aware, but it's going to set the stage for June 3rd and going forward. And we're going to keep pushing forward. We're going to keep moving forward and we're going to keep building because every step we take, we gain momentum and uh, we're very, very excited for the future. And we're going to keep the establishment parties accountable and their feet to their fire, to their feet to the fire uh, outside the legislature going forward on June 3rd, hopefully inside the legislature as well, because the best is yet to come. OK, th this was the question I had before I forget. People are saying voting is rigged, yada, yada. Are you using uh, uh, electronic voting machines in the Ontario provincial elections? So they've got Dominion voting machines and they didn't tell us as a new party that they brought them in in, um, I think, half the polls. They brought them in in 2018 at a few polls. And it was, in fact, the Ford PCs who made a public letter to Elections Ontario about these machines. And then it quickly went away. And then we had the U.S. election happen uh, where concerns were raised. So we need scrutineers. So if you're in Ontario and you want to help, we need you to reach out on newblueontario.com to your candidate, to our candidate in your writing to sign up and scrutineer because we need to make sure the numbers all add up, the number of people who are voting, because you can still see how many people are coming to vote uh, and then the tally at the end. And, and it all has to balance. And we can access the ballots after the fact if we need in a close race. But I will say this, and you know this better than anyone, it's not the same as the U.S. system, right? Because uh, the U.S. system has a lot of controversy for a variety of reasons. Number one, in every state and in many towns and municipalities, they create their own way of voting for the same election. And they change the, um, you know, the mail-in process. They change what the ballot looks like. They have ballot harvesting where someone shows up, some Democrat shows up with a thousand ballots and they are submitted. We don't have that in Ontario. There is mail-in ballots, but it's uniform process from Elections Ontario. The ballot's the same in every poll and every riding. The system is the same. The cutoff is the same. And there's no ballot harvesting where someone can't show up with a more than one ballot. So we have to be diligent and keep track of what's going on because in every election, there's fraud. Like that's every, and No one would say otherwise unless they're uh, just making it up. But it's important to minimize the fraud or minimize someone that's showing up to vote two, three, four times. And just and that's only been done through scrutineering. Just so YouTube knows, we're talking about the Canadian election because you can't use the F word in the context of American. Now, by the way, I, I actually didn't, I, I had heard and I just Googled it now, but I was not aware that in Ontario, you're using electronic and Dominion. Uh, in in federally, it's paper, it's paper ballot. Right. You know, we don't have that concern. Yeah, I can see people being a little skeptical now. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, um, but there's there's many, many reasons why we shouldn't do what we're doing and we shouldn't vote. And if we do that and we don't vote, um, the establishment parties win. Um, if we don't vote and our people stop, if we stop running candidates and we stop this advocacy and we stop talking about what's going on, the establishment parties win. They don't have to respond to the new blue. They don't have to run away from their record on COVID for the last two years. They don't have to pretend they're bringing in tax cuts for a campaign. Um, and so do not be discouraged by the reasons that, uh, by the things that are in the way to hold us back, be encouraged by the fact that what we're doing is the right thing to do and that we're going to keep doing it past June 3rd and that more and more Ontarians that learn about the new blue party want to support us and we will make a dent and we will continue to have an impact for crying out loud, Dave, I started the ax to carbon tax campaign in 2017 and Pierre Polyev is running for federal leader now. And the one thing he says every day is ax the carbon tax, ax the carbon tax. And the entire conservative establishment was trying to pretend that they had never heard of this ax the carbon tax campaign for seven years. And so if that's not an indicator of how we change the rhetoric and we're forcing political parties to turn their positions and adapt and adopt what the grassroots are telling them, that is a, the best indicator. And Roman Babber's running for federal leader. He's talking about lobbyists 
boy, I wonder who started talking about lobbyists taking over political parties in Ontario and federal politics. It was me and Belinda. And we've had other uh, politicians talking about internal party uh, elections and how they're rigged in Ontario and in Canada. And so this will continue to change the narrative. And there are there's every excuse in the book to stop, including how terrible it is that they're using machines. I mean, we want to see the ballots and we want to count it, but we've got to keep moving forward. All right. Last question. I know people have been asking it. Uh, Two part question. What's your take on the WHO treaty that's currently being discussed in Davos? And no one's going to find you or Belinda on the WEF website anytime soon. Ah, they would. Ne- yeah, they would never let me in. Uh, I I just mentioned the Axe the Carbon Tax campaign and those who followed us know our position on international treaties and that we're against international uh, bodies setting policy for local governments, whether it's at the federal, municipal or provincial letter. And you know how they know that? Because I was the guy saying back in 2016 and 17 when Doug Ford and the PC party and Patrick Brown and all the others said, oh, it's OK, Paris Accord. Yeah, we'll we'll achieve the Paris Accord. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll sign up for that. I was the guy that was saying Canada should not be going around signing international agreements and then coming back and Trudeau telling provincial leaders and municipal leaders, I made this agreement and I want you to do everything you do uh, municipally or provincially to achieve those obligations. That is backwards. That is upside down. It is about local government and it is about being accountable to taxpayers. So whether it's the Paris Accord, WEF, WHO, I am the longstanding guy that has been saying in provincial politics in Ontario and federal policies should be set, whether it's on health care, whether it's on greenhouse gas emissions, on the views and, and being accountable to your the people you represent and your own taxpayers. And uh, we talked about it with the Paris Accord in 2017, put it on the map, and my views are the same. But the New Blue Party is a provincial party. And we focus on talking about what provincial and municipal politicians are doing in Ontario, whether it has the WEF label on it or the WHO label or not. Because a lot of the ideas come into Ontario politics and they might not tell you that they went to Davos. They might not tell you that they are reading what the international bodies are doing. Um, But the ideas are very similar. So we call it out whether... It says sponsored by Davos or not. And it's important that we don't lose focus and spend all our time talking about international treaties and not um, uh, hold the feet to the fire of municipal, local politicians in Ontario and provincial politicians who are doing the exact same thing, but no one's talking about it because they're not being held accountable. There was one amazing, sorry, I know uh, uh, we're, we're out of time, but- Don't worry, don't worry. In Waterloo Region, They passed this law, and we missed it. They passed this law a year or two ago, banning political campaign signs from regional roads. Think about this for a minute. So if it's a sign that says stucco or get your driveway paved, that's okay. But a political campaign sign on a regional road, not allowed, supposedly, and, and the press asked us about this, Ben, because some of our volunteers didn't know about the new law and in the first few days of the campaign put up signs. And then as soon as we got uh, complaints, we had some vandals who thought they were the police going out there and taking down our signs. When, give us a day, we'll go move it because we don't want to lose the signs. It's paid for by our donors, hard-earned money. So I look, So this is totally undemocratic. It's against grassroots campaigning, and it only helps the establishment parties, because the fewer signs that the new blue party or an independent can put up, better for the PCs, the liberals, and the NDP, right? Because we need the awareness. So I went and looked up court cases in Canada on bans. And the basic principle that the courts have said is there you can't have an outright ban on political campaign sites. Municipalities can set rules on how, you know, how and where and that kind of thing. And they're doing it on the premise of it's better for the environment not to have it, not to campaign. Uh, it's kind of the same value and principle that I said earlier. The best way to get vote, rid of voter fraud is just not have any elections. And they're doing it. So there's an example of an undemocratic, an attack to our democracy at the local level that's getting very, very little coverage where they put in a law and they say that's the rule of law when in fact their law is illegal and totally unconstitutional. And we just haven't had the case where someone's challenged it 
through the court system. So we've got to spend as much time talking about what's going on in our own backyards as we do what's going on in Davos. All right. Amazing. Jim, uh, someone said, which is congratulations in Hebrew, Eyal Naman, but uh, I guess congratulations for everything that's been done up to now. Everyone who's watching this, clip, snip, and share segments, tidbits. I'm going to try to post the entire interview on Viva Clips, if it's not this afternoon, by tomorrow. But uh, clip and share so that people can see what's going on, Twitter, social media, etc. If you're in Ontario, get out and vote and vote your conscience. Jim, Godspeed, best of luck. Uh, you know, however you feel about politics, what you and Belinda have done in the last couple of years, nothing shy of monumental. So, man, good luck Thursday. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And we're sticking by our supporters because they've stuck behind us for the last few years, despite all the trials and tribulations. We're not going anywhere, and the best is yet to come. Awesome, man. Oh, we'll, we'll follow up after the ele- after the election, anyhow, on Thursday. Thank you. All right, have a good one.